I'm going to make a painting of a skull and my face from this selfie in order to show you how the skull and its structure relates to the human head and the human face. And I also want to show you the proportions of the human face. And I'm going to do this in black and white oil paint. What I want to do is show you how I attach the canvas panel to the bulletin board that I have behind it, the cork board. I use two strips of cardboard and then I just take a staple gun. And when I'm stapling it in, the top part, I actually kind of push it down <clears throat> so that the cardboard engages a little bit more with the edges of the canvas. And that way I can make sure that um, I can paint up to the edges without any kind of overlap on the canvas panel. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how I block in ahead and talk about the proportions of the face in order to do that. So the human head is basically a sort of uh, egg shape, okay? And so is the skull. But when you're painting the head, uh, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that it has facets to it. And um, because I'm bald, it, it, this is going to be a little easier for you to see when I show you this, but let me just talk about the proportions. And the first thing that I think about with proportions is this thing that I think of as the rule of halves um, or halves. Uh, and what I'm sp specifically talking about is if you can figure out the halfway mark on just about anything, the human figure, uh, still life, and you can work from half components, I think you're going to be better off. So first of all, the human head is symmetrical. Uh, it's it's um, bilaterally symmetrical, which means that on either side of the head is, um, is an equal space. The eye line, where the eye sockets fall in, is also in the middle of the head. So it's almost like you're making an egg and you're providing a point where um, it's almost like a, a sniper shot there. Now the other thing that's kind of important is there's another series of proportions that make up the bottom half of the face, which are a series of half measures as well. So the bottom of the nose and the bottom of the, and that's why I'm giving you a, a skull here, is halfway between the chin bottom and uh, the, the eye line. The place where the teeth meet is also halfway between the bottom of the nose and the bottom of the chin. So those are all important things to, to notice. What I'm going to do is I'm going to wipe this out. And this is something that um, is kind of cool about oil paint, is that the more the surface of the, the canvas is kind of uh, moist, it kind of moves things around a little bit. So let's go over that again. The human head is basically an egg shape. And some of the important ideas about this egg shape are that I'm going to talk about the rule of halves. The head, the top and the bottom, from the bottom of the chin to the top of the head, the eyes sit directly in the center of the head. On the bottom part of the head, the nose or the cavity for the nose, the bottom of the nose, falls halfway between the chin and the eye line. Where your teeth meet is also kind of where your lips meet, and that's about halfway as well. Now, the eyebrows, or the brow ridge, is slightly above that, and with a skull you're going to see that, that brow ridge there, and it's right where your eyebrows kind of uh, fall. Okay. Now, there's also some other things that you need to know about the skull. Let's get into it a little bit. First of all, the eye holes are a little bit like aviator glasses. Uh, those sunglasses that um, you know uh, pilots wear. The uh, nose hole, which runs up to about here, is really kind of an upside down heart. Okay? Now, 
there are a couple of important things about the bottom of the chin and the jaw and also the top of the head that you need to know about. First of all, there is a structure called the zygomatic arch or the, the cheekbones that do a shape something like this and come back in. Okay, so that's the top part of your head and your jaw hangs off of your skull. So the jaw actually has a couple of facets in it. I like to think of them, you can, as it has a sort of flat facet on the bottom and then a slightly angled facet, okay, and then another facet that goes up into the cheekbones or zygomatic arch. The top of the head has, um, depending on the person, kind of three facets as well. Uh, they, you know, the top of the head has a facet that goes like this. It also has a slightly um, flattened out part here and then another facet on the side. And depending on the person, it can come in or it can curve and you have to look at the shape of the person's skull, but that gives you kind of an idea of how all of those facets and things work, okay? The, there is also a slight indentation here, and above where the eyebrows are is another brow ridge that you can see. If you are going to um, do teeth, basically everything's symmetrical. So find the halfway mark, find the halfway mark, find the halfway mark, and you have it. So I have this head laid, laid here, a skull, and what I want to do is I'm just going to quickly shade it in because what happens with shading is you get volume. And I'm going to use some white oil paint and some, some uh, black oil paint to kind of make this look as sort of photographic and tonal as I can. So when I photograph this, I photograph my head and the skull head at the same angle so that the light or chiaroscuro was running across it from right to left and it makes it look more volumetric. So let me show you a little something about um, the overall shape of the head before I begin. Okay, if the shape of the head is roughly an egg, right? And the light is moving across it, there are several facets to how light moves across something. There's a core shadow, okay? And then as it moves towards the edge, it starts lightening up until it gets to the very edge, right? And I'm going to show you that on the very edge of things, like the human head and a, um, a sphere or an egg or an oval-like shape, there's something called reflected light, okay? So if you look at this, you can see that the light on this has a core shadow that runs to about there, runs across, and there are big planes of light and dark. All right, so how does that relate to what we're painting? Well, if you look at the photograph, And if we look at the photograph and we do some things that I want you to see in the photo, basically, um, I'm going to run a filter on it that I think will help a lot. Um, one of the things that I do is Photoshop has these sort of blur functions, okay? And one of the things is the smart blur function. If you just go for the factory defaults that are already in Photoshop and you go to smart blur and you click it, um, wrong one. As long as your image is 600 pixels tall at 72 dots per inch, let me show you that in terms of how this looks. Um, let's make this 600. Nope. <laughs> 600 pixels tall, okay, and 72 dots per inch. I'm going to view it so that it fits on the screen, but one of the things I want to talk about is how to use Photoshop to sort of psych yourself into understanding forms. If you go to the filter that's called Smart Sharpen, or um, Smart Blur, Blur, and then Smart Blur, 
you'll see what happens is it generalizes the form. Now do you see the core shadow there? The tones that are moving across and then reflected light at the edge of this. It's even bouncing off the table and filling in its bounce light. On my face is the same thing. If I was to uh, make this image size um, 600 pixels tall, at 72 dots per inch. Let's view it full size. And I was to run that filter again, blur, smart blur. You'll see that the cool thing about Photoshop is it chunks up the values into those big values. If you have a painting teacher, sometimes they'll tell you to blur your eyes or take off your glasses so that you look at it as big shapes and values rather than lines. And that's what's kind of happening here. With, with this Photoshop thing. So let me uh, rework this one more time. I'm gonna wipe it out and I'm gonna redraw it. Um, and what I wanna do is kinda show you how to paint the skull, more or less from start to finish. And then I'm gonna show you how I paint my head using that information. So let's go over the basics again. Um, the brushes I'm using are um, from the Blick Company, and this is a number 16 Academic Bristle Flat, uh, which is, you know, it's just a very durable brush. And uh, I'm gonna just start sketching the way that I do things to block things in, rather than that oval that I showed you before. I'm just kind of thinking uh, about how I paint rather than those rules of proportion. So, what I do is I think about the big forms first and the idealized forms that I have in my head about how a chin settles and I also look at the the photograph or the skull that I'm painting and I don't think there's anything wrong with painting um, from photographs. Everybody sort of crabs about that, but, uh, you know, as if, oh, that, that changes your vision. But actually, it does change your vision in a good way. It makes you see things more flat. And I'm using those proportions that I was thinking about before of, you know, the half units, okay? I'm switching to a larger brush, a number 20. Uh, and the reason for this is it, it just allows you to block things in more quickly. Now, one of the other things that I want to show you is that I have this value scale thing here. And sometimes if you get one of these from an art supply store or make one yourself out of pencil or oil paint, you can match up the values you see on the screen. Like let's say there's a number nine in the brightest areas and it goes all the way to the black, but uh, let's say this area here um, where the core shadow is, is a number four, okay? Um, and uh, behind the zygomatic arch is a three or a two. Those, if you think about it in those ways, what'll happen for you is you start sort of quantifying it and it's almost like digitizing it in your head about what the value structure should be. Now, you know, a lot of teachers say um, start with me middle tones, and yeah, I guess that's a good way to think about it, and I often 
think of things in the middle tones, but I break a lot of the rules when I'm painting. And one of the rules that I break is a lot of times I'll start with some darks and then I'll pull it into light and then I'll pull it back into dark because oil paint is incredibly flexible and allows you to correct as you work. Okay, now I've got some darks laid in, some medium tones because I sort of toned the, uh, the canvas panel. And I'm just going to uh, take a little bit of actually almost straight white and I'm going to start blocking in some of the large lighter areas and then I'll work those tones together. See, I'm not getting involved in any of the details at the start. That's kind of important. If you look at a Rembrandt painting or you look at some of the old masters, especially from after 1600 in Europe, you'll find that what they do is they tend to rely on large forms and uh, things in the darker areas actually kind of dissolve. So here's another thing that's happening that I'm doing that um, you know, sometimes people think it's not a great idea, is I'm actually kind of mixing on the, uh, on the canvas. But if you think about it, that's what oil paint's designed to do. It's designed to be soft and, and smushy and allow you to mix things. So... You can always add detail later, but see, I'm using the biggest brush I have. Okay.
Now, one of the things that I think about are something called hard and soft edges when I'm painting. Uh, for instance, on this side of the skull is a soft edge. On the other side of the skull is a harder edge. Um, and those edges set other things off so that you can see them better. Okay? <clears throat> now, you could keep going forever. Uh, if you want to make it photographic, you just keep working it up and keep adding more paint and working out little transitions of tone or value. Um, I actually suggest that you make a lot of paintings and a lot of black and white paintings of faces and skulls and don't bring them past this level for a while. Uh, I know that sounds like a weird thing to say because people get so caught up in working out details. It's the seductive part, but the first thing that people see when you're making a painting or when they're looking at your painting is they look for a correct structure and overall value structure. That almost looks, um, you know, if you were to blur your eyes or see it from across the room, you would assume it was a kind of finished painting. And I think that's the important part, is that um, you get, you do a hundred starts, you do almost thousands of starts of paintings until you get really comfortable with getting the painting started and then start working into details like teeth and, and all this other stuff. And now I want to show you how that works with, um, with faces, with a face that's lit pretty much the same way as, um, as this skull is lit. It's a, it's a portrait of me or a, uh, um, a photo of me that I took with a selfie stick. And um, I'm going to just kind of show you how I would use the, the same proportions of the skull to work out my face in this, okay? Yeah. I'm going to start the same way, uh, basically. What I do is I look first. I'm going to try to make it fit into the same proportions as the skull next to it. And I'm going to look at the overall light and dark forms that I see. Bottom of the nose. The lips. Now, something that you need to know is uh, the ears stop where the mouth line is, just above it, and the top of the ears, depending on the angle of the head, stop right where the eyes are. So here are the ears on the sides. Okay. Some of you guys are going to want to get involved with the glasses right away. Don't do that. <laughs> Stop yourself. Take a look at it in terms of tone. There's the core shadow on my big bald head. If you look at everything as, as big tones first, big abstract shapes, it's going to make it a lot easier for you to think about how to draw and paint um, people.
Now that's already, uh, I think, looks quite a bit like me because the overall shapes are pretty accurate. One of the other things that I do is I vary the pressure on the brush. So if you push down harder, it, le it loads more paint on. If you lighten as you push, if you don't push very hard, it doesn't uh, put as much paint down there. There's some reflected light. So I think that the biggest mistake that a lot of beginning painters make, maybe even a lot of senior painters make, is that they get too involved with the details right away. They don't block things in as big uh, masses of light and shadow. And as a result, they lose the overall structure of whatever they're drawing and painting. And that makes it um, a little harder for them to recuperate that if you've taken the painting too far and there's too much paint actually on the on the painting already. So what I generally do is I start with thinner layers at the beginning and um, and then I work the paint up so that I get thicker and thicker and thicker stuff as I work out big tones and big values. Now, I think that what my teachers were talking about when they were talking about, you know, work the middle tones first, is that, um, see how there aren't really that many absolute darks in this yet? That helps a lot to allow you to fix it if you mess up. Uh, you can go back in and sort of rework those tones and get it worked out better. looks kind of like me, I think, just it doesn't have glasses on yet. Now, if you understand how a uh, sphere is shaded, and you know how to look for the, uh, the core shadow and the highlight and the middle tones, I think you're going to have an easier time. So you may want to practice drawing uh, some still life um, of objects like baseballs and um, coffee cups and things like that because it'll help you to understand how light and shadow work um, to make big forms and also you'll understand the physics of light a little bit more if you do that.
Now, this is actually, I would say if you're a beginning painter, stop here for the most part and maybe even wipe out the entire canvas and start on another one or repaint the same thing again. And the reason why I'm saying that is really you got to make a lot of starts before you can make a really good finish. And one of the things that, um, you know, there's this guy Malcolm Gladwell and all these other authors who talk about this stuff, but I think one of the most important things that I got from some of those books, and it just seems clear from my own experience that that's the case, um, uh, Craig Nelson, I think at the Art Academy in, um, in San Francisco, calls it brush time. And it's almost like, you know, you're, you're a, uh, a pilot who has um, spent so much time flying that you have a memory of how to use the brush. And it's kind of like watching someone who's really good at basketball or, uh, or another sport, and you're like amazed at their virtuosity, that they can do that and that they, they hit it every time. And the reason is probably why most people are, uh, you know, in awe of people who are good at, for instance, sports or, or, uh, or painting or, or, you know, playing a musical instrument, is that they've done it so much and you have to love doing it. If you don't, don't bother to become an artist. If you're just doing it more or less for, uh, you know, some sort of um, an ideal rather than reality, you're not going to do it because you won't stick with it. It's like, you know, people who are totally into yoga and their health, they work harder than, than other people, and they do it all the time. And so I'm obsessive about painting as much as I possibly can to the detriment of other things. Like I just sometimes I don't want to hang out with my friends because I'd rather paint and I'd rather do this than be social. Um, and so I'm just kind of suggesting that uh, it's, it's wonderful if you're a hermit, if you don't like people very much. And I like people, but they frighten me. <laughs> so um, one of my favorite things to do is just stay home and, and work and paint. Um, and it, it gives me so much pleasure that it's kind of like, you know, those people who are obsessively practicing violin. I mean... You know, it's a good thing that, uh, that I don't play uh, a musical instrument because I, well, I do a little bit, but I would drive my neighbors crazy if I was as obsessed with playing music as I am with trying to master oil painting. And I just don't think that um, I'm good enough yet. And maybe that's a healthy attitude to have because it's going to keep me working as much as I can to try to um, make art that is better, you know. Um, if you're dissatisfied with every painting you make, you're going to want to get to the next level. It, um, it's, a, it's a bit like video games. So my suggestion uh, to, to all of you is uh, do it obsessively. Do it all the time. Think about it all the time. Go visit museums. Draw all the time. And my teacher, Erwin Greenberg, used to, used to say that when we were in high school. Like, he just thinks that, he thought that that was, he used to say, uh, an artist is a person with a sketchbook attached. Um, and if you're not obsessed with working and obsessed with recording the world around you, you're just not going to be a good artist. You just have to be so into it that you want to keep uh, working all the time. So... Uh, thanks for your time uh, watching my video, and, uh, you know, I hope that, you, that this matters to you, that it helps you if you're an artist who's starting out. Thank you.